Hello, everyone, and good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Wu University event with Dr. Cecilia Ketting. Uh, we will be discussing earlier co-management of today's glaucoma patient with the latest medical therapies and drug delivery methods. So I'll be your host today, Dr. Ariel Serenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Ketting practices at an MD-OD uh, setting in Heinz site in Denver, Colorado. She just recently moved there. I uh, got to hear about all of her cool hiking adventures that she gets to, gets to do in her backyard. Um, her primary focus is in anterior segment and ocular surface disease, neurooptometry, and perioperative care. Dr. Ketting is a fellow in the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, an active member of the American Opt Optometric Association, and has served as both the local and state offices in the AOA as well. She was named, named Young Optometrist of the Year in 2019 by the state of Virginia, receiving the Vanguard of the Year Award, and she lectures locally, nationally, and internationally at conferences and has written um, I've seen tons and tons of articles by uh, Dr. Ketting, so we're so pleased that she's joining us tonight and excited to learn all of the um, all of the knowledge that she has to share with us. So I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Such a warm welcome. Um, and welcome to all of you tonight uh, for showing up. We are at 730 and counting. That's wonderful. So I'm very excited to get to chat with all of you tonight. Um, just putting up financial disclosures here and just have to mention they've all been mitigated. So as mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking about cataract patients and a little bit more about how we are maybe changing our earlier management of some of these patients um, as far as when we talk about MIGs or different options, medications, topical, and now we have some different um, options as far as delivery for medications. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well as some of the things that are in pipeline. So let's talk, we can't talk about glaucoma without mentioning why are we talking about glaucoma, right? We know it's important. We know that it's, it's something that we want to catch as early as possible because it can be detrimental to our patient's functional vision. Um, and there are over 70 million affected patients worldwide. That's quite a bit of people. And that's those who've been diagnosed. We know very well that there's a lot of patients that we're watching as a glaucoma suspect um, that will eventually turn into somebody who has glaucoma as well as those who have not been diagnosed because we may not even be seeing them in our office. 3.3 um, million of those patients are within the United States and 10 million visits within their physicians each year. That's a lot of time in our chair. And some of these things that we're gonna talk about may kind of help with decreasing some of those visits in our chairs because some of those are med checks, right? Or uh, are, how are you doing on the medications or starting a new medication, changing medications? And this is an estimated $2.5 billion cost annually to the healthcare. The burden of the disease itself is also that it is not always easily detected, uh, especially by our patients. If a patient isn't faced with something in, you know, right there saying, hey, there's an issue, they may not come and talk to us unless there's another reason. Uh, we know very well that there's times we catch our patients who are coming in for their annual exams or their first exam because they're presbyopic and we say, hey, look, there's some other things going on here. We're looking at your nerves and they're suspicious. They're, you know, concerning for this problem that could take your vision permanently and not be able to get it back. So we, we have to remember that um, there are all of these patients we need to be identifying as well as what happens when they do have glaucoma. There's the, the burden of the disease itself, the being on the medications, the stress and the depression that can come with having something that's a chronic disease. And the earlier we catch these patients, the better off they're going to be. And the least amount of vision loss we can have, the better, because that's going to start to affect not only, you know, we talk about vision, but think about function. It's functional vision that we're losing. We're losing peripheral. Driving is a concern. Um, walking, mobility. Our patient who's 55 and has glaucoma 
they may not have some of the same motility issues that they will 30 years from now, which is just as much of a reason that we need to be controlling it as best as we can. Our standard treatments, and really the only modifiable factor that we know of as of right now, is controlling the IOP. Controlling that pressure within the eye allows us to help mitigate progression and worsening of this disease. Uh, our current standard you know, medications we use, the glaucoma topical medications, our SLTs, ALT not really so much anymore, but you can count it in that group. Um, invasive surgeries, we talk about trabeculectomies, shunts, um, things that are more for patients who uh, are severe or um, hard to control um, when it's uncontrolled and kind of rampant as far as the pressures, and then microinvasive glaucoma surgery. Long-term exposure to some of the medications is a challenge for us. We know that we're constantly combating corneal surface disease, and unfortunately, we may be creating one problem in solving another. Um, we also have issues with compliance, especially the more that patients are on medications or the more medications that they're on, we see a decrease in the compliance of these patients. Another thing is that there are risks associated with more invasive surgeries. So if we're able to control these patients and keep them from getting to the point where they need invasive surgeries, um, obviously not always the case, but if we can, there are, you know, decreased risk associated with that, as well as decreased cost burden to our patients. So when we look at our patients, we, um, we have to talk about, you know, who, because we really want to aim, we're talking about earlier glaucoma treatment, right? So we really want to be talking more about the space of mild to moderate glaucoma, which is about 77% of our patients, um, of those patients who've been diagnosed with glaucoma, 13% uh, advanced and about 10% refractory. So we really want to try to shift everything from being more aggressive and more proactive in our patients um, to those who are earlier in their disease state. Again, talking about compliance issues, and, and I, we'll talk about this a few more times because it's just a legitimate problem we have, right? It's the part of working with humans, compliance, our own compliance as patients ourselves, we know is not always great. Um, and so with them, we know that 50, they estimate about 50% are non-compliant, 16% are totally non-compliant, about 35% are improperly administering the drops. And this may include putting another drop, an artificial tear in uh, shortly thereafter and washing the medication out, not putting the drop in properly so it actually gets in there. And these things can lead to, even though they're technically on medication, the medication not controlling the glaucoma the way it should be. So first, let's talk about current and emerging pharmacological therapy options. We're going to talk a little bit about this just because there's been a few things that have changed in the space. When we're talking about drops and things that we have to think about when picking a drop for a patient who is in that mild to moderate and even severe, um, think about you know things that may make this patient not want to use it and having a conversation with the patient about some of the side effects that they may have from the drops, like irritation on installation, ocular surface toxicity that may lead to worsening of ocular surface disease or new ocular surface disease, the compliance, again, um, patients who are having issues with being able to take the drops, dexterity issues. I know that sometimes there are, when I have an option between one drop and another that may have a different shaped bottle and I have a patient who has RA or problems with dexterity with the hand, I may, I may decide and choose a medication based on the bottle shape if they have similar efficacy, because I know that the patient will be able to handle that medication and deliver the medication a little bit easier. Um, ocular redness, thinking about um, changes to the anexa, we've got discoloration of the iris, uh, as well as thinking about disease of burden as far as uh, mentally to our patients, the more that they have to take and having to constantly think about taking their medications, uh, especially with the more medications they're on and um, thinking about the burden of cost for our patients. So with multiple drops, there is an increase of non-adherence um, by 60% 
as we increase the number of bottles that these have, these patients have. When we increase the dosage, we have a 32%. So we either way we go, we unfortunately really should just plan that our patients, unfortunately, are not probably going to be compliant. And that's one of the things when I see my patients and we're checking up, I ask them, I say, hey, when was the last time you used your drop? Not, are you using your drop? Because they'll always say yes. They want to give us the good news, right? That they're doing what they should. But I like to ask, when was the last time you took that drop? How many times a week do you miss that drop? I make the assumption that they are not taking it 100% because they're human. It's probably the truth. And I don't want it to be a give me bad news. I'm going to assume you're not taking it all the time. So just let me know the amount. And then that way, when I see a change on visual field, when I see a change on the OCT, I'm not feeling like, oh no, I need to throw the whole treatment out the window and do something new because it's not working. No, it's because I had a conversation with my my patient and they're letting me know that they're not compliant. So maybe we need to think about some other kind of treatment. So when we talk about IOP um, lowering drugs, we look at the different sites of action. Remember, we have four different areas that it can work. We can increase the uveoscleral outflow. We can work on aqueous suppression open the angle um, with me uh, mechanical tension, decrease trabecular outflow resistance, uh, and then also uh, we'll talk a little bit about reducing the EVP. Within the last over 100 years, let's talk about even just the last few years, um, we have not had a lot of new medications that have jumped onto the market um, as far as what they do. More recently, we have had a few that have jumped on. Um, that is specifically when we're talking about um, nitrous oxide donating PGA and rock inhibitors. Um, this is a new class that we weren't, um, especially the rock inhibitors, this is a new class that we didn't have existing prior to um, just a few short years ago. Prior to that, it was not you see on the timeline, not not too many things entering the market and making a big shift for us. Um, with the nitric oxide donating uh, PGA, this helps to work by increasing the uveal scleral outflow by relaxing the trabecular meshwork and the scleral channel. The other option, which was the lanoprostine bunod, um, in phase three studies, Apollo and Lunar showed a significant IOP reduction from the baseline in high pressure range patients, patients who had a high IOP. Uh, and it also had a greater reduction from baseline than Timolol. Why do we keep going back to Timolol? Well, because it's still considered the gold standard. So when any company goes to do FDA trials, that is what they are looking to match is that they are not inferior to Timolol, which we would hope, right? Because we don't really want anything inferior. We, we want things that are definitely superior to it because that is something that is not necessarily our go-to because we do get a higher percentage of decrease with so many other medications. With the ROC inhibitors, um, this works to increase uh, cell contraction, uh, extracellular matrix production in the trabecular outflow pathway. Um, and it specifically is targeting the trabecular outflow pathway. So this is you know, working again in a different area in a different way than previous medications that we had. Um, some downsides that come along with the rock inhibitors is we do get a significant amount of uh, redness and um, injection in these patients. And sometimes that has unfortunately pushed us to use this and um, its uh, cohorts where it's mixed in with a little bit less because patients complain. I will have to say that it works really well. And if I give a patient a heads up um, that this is going to happen, they're not always minding it so much. And again, sometimes I'll have them use, um, we've got uh, Lumify. So you can have them use Lumify along with it. It does help decrease. I find that if they stay on it for a month, um, a little bit over a month, you see some of the patients start to have a decrease in that redness to begin with, uh, or it, it improves. So then it's more of a, just hold on. Let's see if this is, this is going to get better for you. And if it's not, it's not like we don't have other options, but I don't 
think a lot of us are using this as a primary or a first line therapy, even though it really does have such a, a drastic decrease in the IOP for our patients. Uh, another one is Nutartacil Latanoprost, um, which we did see a 30% reduction in the studies um, in IOP compared with the latanoprost monotherapy patients. So um, that ROC inhibitor plus the latanoprost, we got a 30% reduction, which was quite a bit. Um, we know that most, when we're talking about monotherapies, we're looking at a 20 to 20 percent. Uh, so this is significantly more than that. And especially when we're thinking about, you know, how progressed is this patient? What is the risk of the patient? What pressure are we looking at? Is this a pressure of 30 versus this is a pressure of 15? And what percentage dis, you know, decrease do we really need? So I think, um, again, kind of challenging ourselves to maybe rethink where we've been putting these now that they've been out a little bit longer, coverage is a little bit better. And we've had some time to actually get our hands on these medications. Another thing to think about um, is compounded medications, preservative-free formulations. I'm a big fan, especially doing quite a bit of ocular surface disease and living in Colorado, which has just jumped that up the window. Um, so we want to decrease the amount of irritation we're putting on that front surface because we don't want to, again, fix a problem and create a new problem front surface decrease, you know, I'm um, sorry, front surface toxicity or damage is going to lead to a decrease in the vision could start to lead to limbal stem cell issues and neurotrophic keratitis. And then we're dealing with a lot more, right? So um, if we have a preservative free option, or if you see a patient who is coming back and they're having issues with the preservatives, there are other ways to go about this. Again, compounded, we have a few that are actually already on market that are preservative free. I believe there's a couple more that are in the pipeline and on the way. The other thing to think about is as we're going to talk about MIGs and sustained delivery devices that may also um, increase the uh, control of the patient's IOP, uh, 24 hours, you know, our diurnal curves and things like that, as well as avoiding um, non-compliance with the medications. Combination therapies are also a good way to go. Uh, another way to compound, um, OSRX and a few other companies started doing this probably uh, five years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. But it really helps to decrease when you've got patients who are on three drops in a day and three separate bottles. Remember, we looked at that statistic, 30% decrease if they have to take that same drop, one bottle more than one time a day, and then a 60% decrease if they have more than one bottle. So what happens if they have three times a day with three different bottles? We've probably got a pretty high rate of non-compliance with these patients. So com combining those drops into one decreases the burden on the front surface. It also decreases the burden on the patient and decreases the cost burden on the patient. Couple things I'm just gonna mention that are in the pipeline coming out. We have NCX from NICOX, um, which is a PGA formed from nitric oxide donating compound. It's in phase three. Um, the Chromaclim Prodrug and QLS, um, both from Claris Bio. It's a, a new method of action that reducts, uh, reduces the episcleral venous pressure. So as you heard me mention earlier when we were talking about areas of um, MOA, this is a new MOA, is working to reduce the um, EVP. Currently, uh, the one of the drugs, the CKLP, is in animal studies only. QLS is in phase two with human studies, so a little bit closer. Lastly, we've got, um, and not least, there are others. Obviously, I'm just mentioning a few. We've got, we know we've always got lots of things in the in the pipeline. This drop is currently used in Japan and Asia and has been since 2018. It's a non-prostaglandin protonoid EP2 receptor agonist. Um, it's been an FDA review. So the FDA is looking at this in the United States and it has been in review for um, a little over a year and a half at this point. So we'll see what happens with that. Okay, so let's talk about other options. Um, especially because we've been we've been talking about the MIG space and we've been talking about some of the new drug deliveries for you know a number of years at this point. But I think remembering that these are not patients who are necessarily severe. 
these are patients where we should be thinking about implementing them in more the mild and moderate um, just to keep them in compliance to keep, keep them from getting to the point where they're more severe and having continued vision loss. So why do we need to talk about sustained IOP reduction, and this is this is both with the sustained delivery devices as well as talking about MIGs, um, because we have fluctuation throughout the day. Why do we do the you know twelve hour IOP check? Why do we have patients come in in the morning? Because we know that that IOP fluctuates throughout the day. Another thing that we know because of that is that um, if patients are missing a drop or they're off by six hours with their drop, especially some of those patients who are more sensitive to, their, to what they're taking, we know that that can cause a shift and ebb and flow of their pressure throughout the day. So we've got periods of time where that pressure is probably higher and collectively over a period of days, weeks, months, years, we're looking at how many points in time where that pressure gets to a place where it may be causing some damage, even if it's not consistently at that level. Um, so Potential advantages of either one of these two things that we're going to talk about is improved adherence, tolerability, sustained IOP control that's more consistent, and um, will have less issues as far as um, their being able to get the drop in and dexterity. So one, the only cur one that's currently FDA approved is the Mataprost implant Durista from Allergan. Um, it is currently the only FDA approved uh, glaucoma drug delivery device. It is one millimeter in length, um, biodegradable, preservative free, and it's placed into the anterior chamber. So it's placed within the eye itself um, using a sterile applicator, the preloaded pre -loaded implant, uh, as well as um, a 24 gauge needle. So goes in intercamerial and it dissolves over about four months. And what they found was about a five to eight millimeter uh, reduction in the patient's baseline IOP for over 15 weeks. So let's do some math. 15 weeks is how many months? Uh, we've got what, three months plus another three weeks. So that is you know, a fairly significant amount of time for a patient where they wouldn't have to use a drop. Now, obviously, probably going to have to figure out how long does it work for your patient. Um, there's obviously some chair time that still has to get in here around that. That probably, I don't know if it was me, it would probably be 12 week mark to say, okay, I'm going to start watching the pressure, see where it is at 12 weeks and then see where they are at 16 weeks, um, especially the first time they use it. Question is, you know, I'm assuming this is going to be have to be uh, implanted by or is implanted only by ophthalmologists. I don't believe any scope um, in any of the states would allow an optometrist to do this. Um, but so what's the cost of the drug, copay, things like that. So if they're paying a copay on it every three, say this patient does every three months, maybe another patient's every four months, so we got this going in four times a year. What's the copay on it? And is that worth it to a patient? Um, so some things we have to keep in mind, right? Another one, uh, the Travaprost interocular implant IDOS TR uh, that is in development by Glaucos, currently in phase two clinical trials. Uh, they are finding or at the phase two clinical trials, I believe they're in phase three right now. Sorry, I misspoke. The um, Phase clinical trials did find that there was an IOP reduction of 8.3 millimeters of mercury uh, from baseline up to 36 months. That's three years. That's good. That's definitely something that I think, you know, when you're talking with these patients about having to do this, cost, burden, everything else, can it be done at the same time as a cataract surgery anyway? That would also be helpful. So, um, Again, this one is a little bit more invasive than the first one, because remember that was kind of resting in the anterior chamber. This does also go into the anterior chamber, but is actually implanted because when you look at it in the photo, it actually looks very similar to um, 
the iStent, which I believe it's also built off the same platform as the iStent. Um, and it's implanted into the trabecular meshwork um, using a very similar uh, application to the uh, iStent. Microdose Latanoprost. Uh, so again, this is not a sustained delivery device, but is still something I think worth talking. Probably should put it in the previous section, but nice idea about this is it does a spray. It does a microdose. So it helps to allow the patient to preserve, um, to keep from using the drop too quickly. We know we've got plenty of patients a lot of times with the prostaglandins where find that it works or the, they're able to get less than a month's worth of doses out of it. So this kind of helps to uh, decrease that problem uh, as well as decrease the amount of preservative that's needed to be used. They're currently in phase two clinical trials and patients are successful about 88% of the time of getting the drops in the eye. Uh, apparently compared to uh, patients who are using standard drops, it's less than 50%, which is kind of interesting. I, you know, we don't, how often do we watch our patients put the drops in their eye? We kind of assume they're doing it correctly and that, you know, sometimes we remember to take the time to do, to have that conversation of how to put drops in. Um, but it's interesting to say that they're noting that uh, less than 50% of the patients who have, are using standard drops in their studies were getting them in properly. Um, they're getting a 29% drop in IOP from baseline, which is consistent with the average of 26% from conventional latanoprost. So not a decrease, even though it's a smaller dosage, they're not finding a decrease in the efficacy of the drop. Intercannulicular travoprost implant, um, OTXTP from Ocular Therapeutics. Uh, this is a reabsorbable, preservative-free intracannulicular um, implant. Uh, so it is put into the AC and left there to dissolve and lasts for approximately 90 days. Um, and it is currently in phase three clinical trials with an IOP reduction of between 3.27 millimeter of mercury and 5.27 millimeters of mercury. So depending on, it'll be kind of curious to see some more information come from that is what is the percentage? Because um, obviously we know if we got a patient with a pressure of 30, um, five is not going to do it. So it, it'll have its place, but I mean, we have to start thinking about this, you know, looking at the timeline, um, if the 36 months to me spoke very high, even the three months, um, but then thinking about with these patients, what's going to be the cost. And then again, what's the cost to them to not have to put a drop in. I know some of us might be willing to pay a little bit of extra money, myself included to maybe be a little Z because I know I'm going to forget about my drops anyway. Punctal plugs um, with latanoprost and travoprost. Uh, so these, obviously, this is going to fall into our realm, right? We do punctal plugs. This is definitely an option that would be something um, we would be able to do, I'm assuming, in clinic um, for our patients. What they're finding is the plug put in um, phase two clinical trials, 20% reduction in IOP at three months with 92% retention, meaning that the plug stayed in place in 92% of the patients. Uh, and so still getting 20% reduction um, in those patients. So three months worth of not having to do a drop. We watch them, put another plug in, let it dissolve. So this is something that's pretty cool as well. Another one that's being uh, investigated right now is the drug lean contact lens. Uh, potential advantages, obviously, the contact lens is going to be sitting there on the eye eight to 12 hours, sometimes 16. Uh, so it can be continuously delivering, better control throughout the day, have decrease in the eye drops. Um, this is obviously not going to be applicable to all patients, though, because not everybody wears contact lenses or wants to wear contact lenses, uh, but may help with some of the compliance issues with the drops, as well as um, the ocular surface disease issues that we tend to get with, with the drops. And we actually already talked about that, so we're going to move on. So as I mentioned, potential benefits of some of these, the, the sustained release medications, um, less burden to the ocular surface, 
definitely an increase in compliance because they don't even have to think about it. But we do have to make sure that we're checking to see whether or not the pressures are in line with where they need to be when the um, when the device is completely dissolved or when is it actually dissolving and with metabolism does it happen faster in one patient than another uh decreased monthly co-pays for the patients 24-hour treatment so we know we've got it going constantly some of the challenge though um obviously we're going some of those that we talked about we would be going into the eye and so this may increase the risk anytime we go into the eye we know we have an increased risk for infections and things like that um what is the optimal dosing frequency like i said when do we need to to redo this in a patient when do we need to put a new plug in when do we have to um have them go back to see the ophthalmologist to have a new uh insert um and who's going to benefit i i you know what i i think most people will benefit either way as long as we bring the pressure down again all options are not going to work for all patients um and i think the big one that i keep bringing up is where's the cost benefit right um again some cost benefit is not just the copays cost benefit is cost benefit to the patient for the time that they have to keep up with the drops um and the the life that they get to live without having to think about the drops all the time Okay, we're switch gears, but not really, because we're still talking about things that are going to decrease the disease burden on our patients, and things that are going to help control their um, control their disease, uh, as well as I still want to urge people to think about MIGS as not a severe patient, and I think we're getting better about this. I think we're having a lot more conversations about it. Um, MIGS are definitely not a severe glaucoma ish or treatment. This is something we can do for our patients who are mild and moderate, especially when they're going to get cataract surgery, because there is no reason that we should not have our surgeons do something while they're already in to decrease the risk that they're going to progress with glaucoma and increase their compliance with treatments because we're decreasing the the drop burden on them. Um, there are approximately 4.3 million cataract procedures in um, a year. Okay. Lots of cataracts we know because you know, it's a gift of life. We're all going to get them. So everybody's inevitably, in theory, if you live long enough, going to have cataract surgery. Um, 22.3 of them who are getting cataract surgery also have a minimum of one ocular hypertension medication. So then in theory, we should be seeing about 22.3% of our cataract patients or very close to getting a MIG. Because again, we're already in there. There's no reason not to do anything that we can to help mitigate um, progression of glaucoma. MIGS are so. I want to. I want when we're talking about MIGS, what we're talking about is IOP lowering surgeries that have they're minimally traumatic, meaning we're minimally invading the eye. Um, we are not doing large surgeries. We're not talking about Ahmed valves. We're not talking about tubes and shunts. Um, we're talking about conjunctiva sparing. So we're not talking typically about bloods, although there are some blood forming makes that I will mention. Um, high safety profile and um, rapid recovery can be combined with cataract surgery or standalone. And then again, these are MIGs are things that are providing a modest IOP lowering um, option other than trabeculectomy. What we do not consider MIGs, um, they are not necessarily a stent. I uh, will again talk about different versions and different things that they do in areas that they are treating. They are not only limited to the time of cataract surgery, although there are some which are only FDA approved to be standalone. And they are not, again, only for moderate or severe patients. So why are we talking about these? Because there are lots of advantages for our patients, same as why we were talking about the sustained delivery um, devices. And um, same thing we're here tonight is to talk about anything we can do to help our patients and decrease the burden of the disease. When should we refer patients for glaucoma-related surgery? Well, I think that, um, again, I'm going to keep saying it, mild. Um, anybody who's got a cataract and has glaucoma or even ocular hypertension, um, there are 
definitely the time, it's the time to have that discussion with the patient. I actually start the discussion with my patient early. Um, I like to, when I start talking about cataracts, if I know they have glaucoma or they have a risk of glaucoma, you know, a lot of times they want to know what are we going to do about it? If I have glaucoma, what can we do as far as treatment? And I mentioned MIGS, I mentioned SLTs, I mentioned, you know, there are things that we, you know, we may be on drops. We may have the option to do other things. Um, and I think that it's good to start that discussion early because we as optometrists are still going to be the people who are treating the glaucoma and monitoring and managing most of these patients uh, long term. Um, and we want to make sure that they know that we know what to do, right? So I think that have the conversation early and then refer the patient when you see fit. Uh, talk with your opto ophthalmologist in the area, find out who does what MIGS, find out who likes to, you know, who is willing to work with you on uh, referrals for patients who you know have glaucoma and cataracts and need to have surgery um, so that you can work with, work with them and co-manage. So it helps to build a good relationship and they will continue to send patients back to you or even refer you patients. So more specifically, when we're talking about referrals for cataract surgery, we know in cataract MIGs, um, they're at their maximum medical therapy. But again, that would be more of our patients who are probably moderate to severe. Not always, right? Because we have patients who have mild because by their definition of loss of visual field, they're mild, but they're on maximum medical therapy and we have no place to go. Absolutely. Patients who are uncontrolled, um, ocular surface disease. So don't forget that, hey, you've got a patient who's got... LSCD, think concerned they're going to develop NK because they're just corny as trash. Send them. See what you can see. What can you do to decrease the burden on that cornea? Um, people who have allergies, uh, we know that there's lots of preservative allergies, um, de dexterity issues, and a um, couple of MIGs can be standalone. We're going to talk again about those. I'm going to start moving into that. Again, preparing your patient for glaucoma surgery, make sure that you're having the conversation with them, but also make sure that when you refer them for surgery, you are sending them with the, um, the stage of glaucoma because before they can make a decision to do surgery or get them cleared for surgery, they have to have a stage. You can't do a MIGS procedure um, without a stage. You can make arguments for it, especially for patients who cannot do a reliable visual field or can't do a visual field. Um, there are some arguments there, but we really want to send them with all of their information, send them armed with everything that they can, and it will speed up the process for the patient and for the surgeon as well. Education pamphlets, anything that you can um, to discuss with the patients about what you're thinking about. A lot of times I keep it vague unless I know um, my surgeon is going to do something specific or I am requesting something specific, but that is the, the, the relationship that I have with my surgeon. Um, other surgeons, that may not be the case. And again, they, they are, it's kind of like discussing IOLs. We want to let them make the decision based on what they get from their, their measurements, but we definitely want to make sure we're making the um, referral for uh, having that done and just a MIG in general. Okay, so let's talk about the couple different, we've got about 10 minutes left. So we're gonna go through the different um, types of uh, MIGs. First, we're gonna kind of break it down into different MOAs. Um, so the first is gunioscopy. Uh, so there are four currently that are gunioscopy based. Um, gunioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculectomy or a GATT with eye track came out in 2014. Kahook dual blade, trabectome, and Trab X. Um, we're going to talk about again. We're here talking about new things, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Trab X. Um, came out in 2018. It is Trab X or Trab X plus, and very similar to the Kahook and the trabectome. Or I'm sorry, yeah, the trabectome. They both work by uh, opening up the trabecular meshwork. The Kahook in the, the Trabex actually 
create a strip of the trabecular meshwork versus completely ablating it, which is what the trabectome does. It goes through and dam and just completely uh, gets rid of it. Um, with the cahook and the trabecular, um, the trabex, it actually makes a strip of the trabecular meshwork that in theory could be taken out and sent off for pathology or for, you know, studies and all these cool things that we could do. And who knows, 30 years from now, maybe we'll use it for something else. But um, Trav X has laser cut sharp blades. Um, the Trav X Plus incorporates uh, irrigation and aspiration at the same time, which actually helps to manage the bleeding and maintenance of a uh, good angle while performing. So it helps to make sure that they can view where they're at. Next group, we've got the trabecular meshwork bypass method of action. In this group would be our eye stent. Uh, one of the OGs of of uh, of MIGS. So the iStent has had a few iterations. We've got the iStent Original, iStent Inject, and currently um, the iStent Inject W, which was released in 2021. And then also within this group is the Hydrus. So the iStent Inject W is very similar to iStent um, the iStent inject itself. The only difference is uh, that it has a larger flange, meaning that circular area. And the reason they increased it was because it was just more for ease of the surgeons being able to handle it, uh, not because it actually, in my understanding, or, um, it, it didn't change the ex the outflow or anything of it. It was more for being able to um, put it in. Uh, the iStent inject and inject W both in two of these little guys, the little bypasses within the trabecular meshwork. Oops, nope, that's a video. We want the video. There we go. So while that's going on, um, so we've got two that are gonna be injected into the trabecular meshwork in order to increase that outflow. When you see these patients on day one after surgery, you may actually see some blood in the anterior chamber um, and we see some RBCs. And if you were watching as that first one was implanted, it actually had a little plume of blood that came out. And that is good. That actually helps the surgeon know that they've put it into the correct space. So here we've got the second one being implanted. Boop, boop. Not too bad. So when we're looking at uh, the patients, I like to make sure that they're in place especially day one, um, but you don't want to use, I don't like to use a gonioscopy lens day one. Um, that was preference of my surgeon as well, just because I uh, didn't putting extra pressure on it. Um, but talk with your surgeon that you're working with and co-managing with, but uh, essentially gonioscopy on there and you can see that it's implanted and make sure it's not dislodged. I've never seen one dislodged. It can happen. I've heard, uh, I've heard some of the stories, um, but definitely want to make sure if you have who's had this and we see a couple weeks later that the pressures are high, um, check to make sure the stent is properly placed and that you aren't having um, a problem with the stent itself. The Hydrus Micro Stent came out in 2018. Uh, definitely, I, I've been a big fan of this. Uh, my surgeons have been a big fan of this as well. Uh, it has actually got three mechanisms of action for allowing for fluid to um, be, to help decrease the IOP. So it's got those separate windows that you see, and the windows are opening um, to the canal facing surface. Um, and it's allowing, it allows it to go to the collector channels. You also get the inlet itself. So it's kind of like a little snorkel. I'll go to the next picture. So you see that little snorkel that's up there, that inlet. And then there we go. Scaffold, which allows to open up. So it's actually opening up the area of drainage within the Schlem's canal. And again, like I talked about, um, an increase in outflow to the collector channels. Neat thing about this is they did do a five-year continuous study. Uh, not a lot of companies will do a five. They'll do a two or a three. They did do a five-year study and they had 80% retention of their patients to that five-year study and watched um, the IOPs. They found that through five years, um, they still had 
about 66% of the patients were medication free at five years, which is nice. Next me mechanism of action, we've got dilation. So within this is the AVIC, the VSCO360, I prime and Omni, as well as the Streamline. So the I prime uh, glaucose was approved in 22. So that was just approved. Um, it is a very viscoelastic during ophthalmic surgery. Um, so I don't have a picture of that one, but very similar. The Omni surgical system is also uh, delivering viscodilation 360 throughout the surgery. So the way that the viscodilation works is they, any of these that are using viscodilation, they're actually pumping viscoelastic, um, same thing that they use during cataract surgery, right? So it's pumping it through um, the area to help open up the drainage canal and the trabecular meshwork. So here we see, I'm going to kind of speed it up here we see that we're going to insert into the trabecular meshwork and you see that little blue, that's gonna, that's actually the um, thread or kind of like the needle in the nozzle for the TRAD 360 or viscoelastic 360. Um, similar is what's happening with the Glaucus one, I believe as well. So it keeps feeding through and as it does, it's opening up mechanically because it's forcing itself through, right? So it's kind of doing a little bit, a bit of a trabecdome type thing there. And then as it is pulled back out of the canal, it releases viscoelastic as it goes. And so it's pushing open and it's extending into the area surrounding. So it's continuously opening it. New addition, this actually made it onto uh, the market FDA approval this summer. It's microgoniotomy and viscodilation with streamline surgical system. So you see that little button at the end. So it functions very similar to like you're putting in an eye stent. Um, it goes into the trabecular meshwork and it makes a little opening there. Okay. It doesn't stay. But what it does is it sprays out viscoelastic to either side to help open up that uh, trabecular meshwork. Uh, and the channels in that direction. I believe this is the last little area that we're going to go through. We've got the last mechan mechanism of action is the um, working in the subconjunctival space. And this is one where we, you know, we talk about when we were talking about the definition of MIG not versus not MIG, um, it technically technically is not disturbing the conjunctiva. Well, the Zen actually does because it's forming uh, a filter or a bleb um, outside the AC. So it is a small, so we can see in there, this little um, zigzaggy implant, and it's kind of a gelatin cross-linked um, filter. So it actually is porous and it is filtered through, it makes its way through the angle to the external area to form a bleb um, so that that fluid can be filtered out. So we see here with a true bleb, they would make a canal and dig a canal and form it. And then you would have the bleb formed outside. The Zen is a little bit different in that it create it still creates a bleb, but it is make it is less likely to scar down because that was one of the problems we had was a lot of scarring of the actual um, exiting area for the trabeculectomy. And here we actually have something that's structured and holding open that area. The blebs tend to be smaller. They're more low-lying and a little bit more diffuse, uh, but do still have their own complications as well as far as the rate of possible um, closure of that bleb. Um, so often when I've had patients who've had this, uh, they had to go back to the surgeon for what's called needling to help open that up. Not on the market currently would be, this is a coming to market. It is in the market, uh, I believe in Europe, but it is not here at this point. This one is in FDA trials. It's, it is a 
uh, micro shunt um, that is supposed to work similar to what we just saw with the Zen, uh, designed to reduce IOP, as are all of these. Um, and it has had some good efficacy in the phase two studies, showing good um, reduction in the patient's IOPs, as well as good safety um, without, you know, without the over decrease um, in pressure or the hypotony that we can possibly get sometimes with um, blebs and everything with that. Can't talk about this without saying, yep, Cypass, you may still see it. Um, no longer in production. Uh, it was pulled from the market because it was causing some endothelial cell loss and risk for need for partial corneal transplants. Um, but you will see still see some patients with these. And very lastly, MIGS in the pipeline. Because uh, we, again, always got fun stuff coming. So one area, we've got drainage to the ocular surface. Uh, we've got two that are being developed there. There is another within the aqueous outflow um, at the meshwork from, it's a therapeutic ultrasound for glaucoma, just kind of interesting. Uh, eye stent is, or glaucose is working in an eye stent infinite, which is working through the Schlem's canal. Um, they're also working on eye prime visco delivery system. Two within the supraciliary drainage areas, we've got eye stent supra um, mini inject, and then MIG blood surgeries, which again, based on the definition of MIG, I don't know, does that still fall in there? I still think I'm going to probably position those, and I, in, in just having worked with glaucoma surgeons, I, I feel that they typically put these on the more severe end for patients, um, just because they can take a little bit more time. Um, We've got a couple of coming in that direction. Thank you all so much for joining me. We're gonna take some questions at this time. All right, great presentation. I uh, was blown away with all of the options that we have for glaucoma. So now. many options. 